I can hear you. Okay, we're going to get started. Okay, it's uh, 11 o'clock. Poker to everybody. Welcome to a, a special class, I would say, by, by Dr. Rifkula. And I think the, what really, I've been thinking of asking for a while to speak, but what got me asking for sure is when, when Mark Shapiro in one of his classes, when he talks on, you know, on great rabbinic like, like figures, so he mentioned your father as one person, I think you were even online when he, he mentioned that figure. You know what, let me ask you to speak on your father. Uh, Dr. Blau wrote this book, Learn Torah, Love Torah, Live Torah, about her father, Rav Mordechai Pinchas Taitz, and uh, it's been, been translated into Hebrew, Bisamachta Bichagecha. And um, Dr. Blau is a longtime educator. Say so she started teaching Torah at the age of 15, being involved in Chinuch. Her and her husband and her three, children, her three sons are all involved in, in Chinuch. Um, she has a PhD from Columbia University in English and Comparative Literature on the topic of the influence of, se of Tehillim on oh. 17th century poetry. Right. So uh, it's a pleasure really to welcome, you know, Dr. Blau, who I guess I've known for many years. Her husband was the Mashkiach, of course, when, when I was in Yeshiva University many years ago, is still there. So it's a pleasure to have you this morning. We look forward to having you speak. And I mentioned the other day, I think it's, it's very beautiful. When I asked Dr. Blau to speak on her father, she says she can only speak about her father. She speaks on her mother too, because her father wouldn't have died, been able to accomplish what he did if not for his um, the, his wife. So, Bakasha, Dr. Blau, we look forward to, to listening to your talk. My pleasure, and uh, it's very nice that the generations carry on friendships that's been between the Kelman and the Tights families for many, many years, thank God. My father used to say, read it telegraphish, speak telegraphically. Speak as though um, you're writing a telegram and you have to pay for every word. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to try to make every word count because there's a lot to tell and I want to tell it as clearly as possible. Um, the best way to tell about my father, Rav Mordechai Pinchas Taitz, is one of Racha, and my mother, Rav Zimbabwe Taitz, is one of Racha, is to start with the Devar Torah. And uh, the one I'm going to tell initially uh, shows the sense of humor and the insight that my father had. It's on Megillah's Esther. We're told that Esther was chosen to be the queen. And then we're told that young women were being gathered a second time to be taken to the king's palace. Why did they need to gather girls again? They just had a new queen. So my father said, that's the way the government functions. If there's a government commission, it keeps going on and on. It doesn't matter whether it fulfills its purpose. There are people who have offices. There are people who have a salary. The government commission goes on. So that's why they kept gathering girls in Shushan, even after Esther was already queen. And to me, that says so much about my father's approach to things, that he could see the humor in a Pasuk in the Megillah, in a verse in the Megillah. At the same time, he showed insight into the way that things actually do function in the world. He believed in looking at the world as it is and trying to cope with it as best as you could. Um, the uh, title of the book that um, uh, Rabbi Kaplan just mentioned, Learn Torah, Love Torah, Live Torah, those are the three L's of Judaism. And my father had that printed um, on every postage, uh, the postage mark that went down, everything that went down from Yeshiva and Elizabeth, because he felt that that was really uh, what we're all about. He wanted to make every moment meaningful. So even when saying the uh, blessing after meals, the Birk um, HaSamazon, he would look at each word. So we say, uh, we thank God who gives us food, Miyacha Hamleya Habsucha, from your hand that is full and open. And my father said that only God's hand can be full and open at the same time. A human hand, if it's full, when you open it, whatever was in it will fall out. But God can endlessly supply us with everything we need. So he even made saying the blessing after the meal into a more meaningful experience. Or when we would go to the New Jersey shore for a vacation in Belmar, and we would see the Atlantic Ocean for the first time that year, he taught us the bracha, Sha'asahayam Hakadol who created the great sea. And he just had a different feeling about the Atlantic Ocean, uh, seeing again for the first time in over 11 months. And it, it made the moment even more meaningful to make a bracha on it, to make a blessing on it. My mother had a different way of conveying things. For example, when I once asked her when I was starting to make Passover, Pesach, on my own for the first time, so I asked her about cleaning certain things. Do you have to bother with this, with that? She said, Riv, do it all open everything, check everything. I said, but why? I know I don't have any chametz, anything leavened in my sewing box. 
And my mother said, do it for the love of the mitzvah. That was the first reason that she gave. And then the second reason that she gave, which taught me a new Yiddish expression, and also taught me how to look at things. She said, anyway, a rich person finds he has much more than he had realized. And you know what? She was right. When you prepare for Passover and you go through all your closets, you discover things you hadn't realized you owned. And um, yeah, it's worthwhile doing it her way. That was how she taught us. I'll give one more insight from my father because I think this is so significant. Uh, we learned that Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, when a student came to his yeshiva, um, no one opened the door for his students except the rabbi himself. This is in Sukkah 28a. My father asked, was there no one else to open the door for the, the study hall except for Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai? And he said, we can learn three lessons from this. First of all, every person entering a new place has trepidation. Everybody's a little nervous. Will I find friends? Will I be accepted? And right from the start, Ryokhan ben Sakai told the student, you're welcome here. Second, there's something uh, embarrassing initially about speaking up. Maybe the Gahams will seem foolish, or maybe my question will be about something everyone else knows. So what Rabbi Yochan ben Sakai was telling the person was, don't worry, we were all new here at one time. I'm welcoming you in. And as we learn in uh, Pirkei Avos, um, uh, a person who's uh, embarrassed and ashamed can't learn. You have to be able to speak up and to ask. And finally, my father said, you learn as much from a teacher, from his personality and his character, as you do from anything he says. And what Rev. Yochanan was modeling was caring and acceptance. So that the student's education began the moment the door opened. That this is a caring, accepting person, a caring, accepting place. My father was born in 1908, my mother in 1914. And from 1914 to 1917, uh, my father Stanley lived in Poltava in Russia instead of in Latvia, uh, where his uncle was the rabbi, because at that time being a rabbi along the battle line in World War I was a very dangerous thing. The Germans thought the rabbi might help the other side and they imprisoned uh, rabbis and held them hostage. And the other side thought, they might be helping and in, or in prison to the rabbi and held them hostage. Whoever got to the rabbi first held them hostage to make sure the, German, the Jewish community uh, would not go against them. So my father's uncle invited them all to Poltava. And my father's uncle, uh, Rav uh, Eliyahu Akiva Rabinovich, was the founder and editor of Hamodia, of that newspaper. And he was also the founder and editor of Hapelis. A learned journal. And what's interesting is that two people who wrote for that journal were relatives of my mother. One was her uncle, Rabbi Yehoshua Yosef Krail, who's the great Talmud Chacham and as a under the name uh, Aleph Lamed Sihan to stay out of the government's notice. Now, what's interesting is that my father and his brothers used to set type for Hamodia and for Hapelis. So years before they met, my father may have already been setting the type for his father-in-law's essays uh, in his journals. We don't know exactly which ones he worked on, but I just found it so fascinating that the two families already had a connection uh, through a Torah journal. I won't go into all the details of who both families were related to, but there was a lot of learning on both sides of the family, including a connection um, to the Lubush from 300 years back, to um, uh, uh, Rav Mordechai Yafi, um, including a connection to the Adaret, who was chief rab assistant to chief rabbi of Yerushalayim, and uh, to his twin, Rav Tzu Yehuda Kuch, who was the father-in-law of, um, of Rav Tzu Yehuda Rabinovich Domen, who was the father-in-law of Rav Kuch, many famous people on both sides. And um, on my mother's side, um, besides this uncle, Rav Yehoshua Yosef Freil, and besides her father, um, her father's sister, Golda Miriam, was married to Rabbi Av Avon Nachman Schwartz, who was the rabbi of Baltimore, and also a tremendous Tamil Chacham. So wherever you turned, the emphasis in the family was on learning. And I'll just show two pictures very quickly. One, whoop, of my uh, grandfather and my mother, my grandmother, and um, a slightly better picture of my grandfather, a larger one. But this is the typical picture of the Litvish Tamil Chacham thoughtful, 
serious and um, uh, very much immersed in learning. Uh, my pictures are at my sister's house right now, all my uh, material that I use for my book, but um, this is the one picture of my father with his mother when he was 13 years old. Uh, his mother was a very important influence in his life. And this is my parents' whoop, wedding picture. Uh, you can see uh, very, very uh, much up to the moment in dressing in tails and a top hat and um, a very handsome couple, thank God. Now, when they married, they married because my father had come to America on the 30th day after Ralph Crail passed away. He came in 1933 on behalf of Tosi Shiva, Rebellio Mayor Bloch. And people had a great idea. Here's a fellow who learned in Slabotka and, and in Tells. And here's Basia Prail, whose father was a Telser. And here's an open position in Elizabeth, New Jersey. If they marry, he could be the rabbi in Elizabeth and everything gets taken care of. That's exactly why my parents did not want to meet each other. My mother did not want to marry as a ticket to a job for her husband. And my father did not want to Oh, he married because he was going to get positioned and he'd have robotus. So they resisted meeting each other for several months. And then finally, I don't know whether it was at a dinner for Tells or whether it was at a wedding, but they started talking to each other, each without realizing at first, oh, this is who everybody has in mind for me. And they found each other very interesting and uh, very attractive. And before you knew it, they were on their way and they were married in January 1935. Now, immediately, uh, they went to Europe because my father had promised his father that if he married um, in the United States, or if he decided to stay in the United States, first he would come home. Language was not a difficulty. My mother had been raised in Yiddish and spoke a beautiful literature Yiddish. In fact, people in Europe were impressed that an American young woman uh, spoke such a good Yiddish. And um, my father very much wanted to learn English. So between the two of them, uh, they were going to see to it that he would learn English. Uh, they were treated very well in Europe. For example, Rev. Aram Dovber Kahana, the uh, Rav of Kovna, uh, made a dinner, a reception for them. And because my father was known as a very fine orator, he was asked to speak in a number of public uh, gatherings. Well, my parents had come from the port in France, across Fr uh, in France, across France, to come to Latvia. They had come by train. It was 1935, and they had seen close up what it was to be under Nazi domination. They saw on the trains, they saw at the, um, at the different stations, Nazi soldiers all around, and a tremendous feeling of fear permeating the population. So when they got to Latvia and Lithuania, my father spoke wherever he could about the fact that Hitler and Achimo really intended to kill Jews. And he advised everyone to get out of Europe as fast as they could. He said, this is not an empty thing. It's not World War I over again, because in World War I, communities had been devastated and then rebuilt. But he said, it's not going to happen this time that way, because he intends to just kill wherever he can. And um, Jabotinsky heard him speaking and asked him to speak on behalf of Jabotinsky, uh, because he was also urging everybody to get out of Europe. As soon as they got back to the United States, the first thing they did was to take their wedding money and to start getting affidavits and getting all the paperwork in order to get as many people out of Europe, as many relatives out of Europe as they could. One brother-in-law even came and was in Elizabeth in 1938. And my brother urged him, don't go back to get my sister and the children, stay here, let her come with the children. And he said, no, she's expecting I can't let her do that by herself, make it such a trip. Well, the next communication was in 1941, and it was a telegram from this brother-in-law saying, felt harassed visa. We're missing the exit visa. We don't have an exit visa, we can't get out. And unfortunately, that was it. They were never heard from again. My father, however, did get his parents out. And in 1940, he got them out. And um, uh, he rescued one brother then, another brother later. So he did his best to get people out. Um, he also went to a United States senator, to Senator Case, to talk to him about paying $100 for each Jew to get 
out of at the point that he was talking out of Germany, out of um, some of the countries that have already been overrun. And Senator Kay said to him, Rabbi, in this election year in the United States, when people are saying that if we go into the war, it's because the Jews are getting us into the war, we can't even discuss a plan of bringing thousands and thousands of Jews to the United States. I, I just can't do it. Meanwhile, my parents were operating with a one word from the Torah, said by Abraham, said by Yaakov, said by Shmuel, said by Yeshayahu, and the word was Hineni. Here am I. My father said, here, wherever you may be, that's where you have to do what you can do. You can't say, oh, I was only in a better place where things were easier, uh, where I had more um, uh, permission to do things. No, here, whatever I'm facing, here, I have to work here. Am is in the present. Here am I. Not to say, oh, well, in Europe back in 1850, oh, yeah, you could be religious then, but not in America in, uh, in 1935. No, it's am in the present. And I, which is the attitude they both took, I'm responsible. Not, well, somebody else really ought to do something about it. No, it's I. I have to do something about it. And my father felt that whatever came up, you have to answer, he named me. Here am I. I have to do what I can, no matter how bad the situation is. The first thing he did was to build a mikvah. And of course, people said, well, we need a mikvah for it. There's a mikvah ritualarium in Newark that the women can use. But my father said that on the Sabbath, on Shabbos, and on the holidays, on Yom Tov, the women couldn't walk from Elizabeth to Newark. And uh, they couldn't take a five-mile trek. And um, he actually built the mikvah, which stunned the people. Uh, they had, they had uh, never thought that um, that should be the first order of priority. The next thing was that there had to be education. And in fact, my father believed that the way you stated a question already complete, uh, contained some, some part of the answer. So he made a booklet about what is your answer to the problem? And this was the first booklet that he did to start the yeshiva in Elizabeth. And he said, what is the problem? The problem is that while in Europe, Jews are worried for their lives and we have to worry about what's going to happen to the whole rich tradition there. Here in the United States, we're losing our children and we're losing, <laughs> we're losing the future. And he felt that the solution was to start a school. And the school would have to start from nursery and kindergarten. It would have to start from three and four year old children to start giving them the taste of what being Jewish was all about, to start having things like a Sabbath party, a Shabbos party, where one little girl would be the mother lighting the candles, one little boy would be the father making kiddush, saying the blessing on the wine. You had to make a Purim carnival where the kids got dressed up in costumes and had a ball. You had to make a Seder, a model Seder, where the kids would learn how to do a Seder. That was for three and four year olds. At five-year-olds, he called it primer. And he said, that's when children can start learning how to read and write. And this was really quite something because in public school, reading and writing started in first grade when the children were six. But what my father wanted to show was that kids were really ready far earlier and amazing. All the children learned how to read and write. Of course, I must mention that the school was very small. It started with two students my brother and one other student. They were soon joined by 10 more students. So that in the second year, there were 12 students. And from there, the school kept growing. What's very interesting um, is uh, that my father thought that recess was a very important part of a child's day because he thought that sitting and learning for an hour or an hour and a half was really straining all the all the uh, resources of a child. And he told teachers that if a child was misbehaving, taking away recess was not the way to solve it. He said that boy or girl needs recess most of all. Don't take away recess. Try to find out why the kid can't take, pay attention, but don't take away recess. And even in much later years, his uh, office window faced out to a very, very large playground that was eventually built uh, for the school. And when he would turn around and see the children playing, he just got a smile on his face 
And he really relished the fact that Jewish kids with a yarmulke on their heads, with their tzitzis tucked into their pockets, but wearing tzitzis, um, could be, and Jewish girls could be running around, having a wonderful time, and knowing that when they'll go back into the classroom, they will get an hour of very good learning in because they had 20 minutes or a half hour of enjoying being outside and the freedom of just playing as kids should. He said he made a Jewish Bill of Rights, a Jewish Child's Bill of Rights. And the first element in the Bill of Rights was every Jewish child has an inalienable right to a Jewish education. And the second item in the Bill of Rights was the first priority of a Jewish community is to provide that education for every child. And he didn't worry about parents who were trying to avoid paying tuition when tuition was $1,200 a year. He didn't worry about people who weren't filling out forms correctly. He felt ultimately, if the child got the education, it was worth it. And it's interesting because my brother has told me and his approach was so right in the end. Uh, my brother told me there was one family that um, had uh, a, a reverse year in the father's business and he really could not pay tuition for several children. I think it was, I don't know how exactly how many, but it was either three or four children. And my brother told him he has a blanket scholarship because he had been paying full tuition until then. He's going through a hard time. The yeshiva can carry his kids. Later on, when he came back to himself and his business came back, he came in and handed my brother a check for the entire tuition for that year that his children had been uh, in the school free of charge. And he said, you carried me when I needed to be carried and now I'm paying back. So my brother said, that's the understanding. And meanwhile, the child was getting the education. So for example, a mother came to him with some Hebrew books, Svarim, that indicated somebody who was very learned. And um, she said, I can give these to the yeshiva. If somebody can use them, fine. If they have to be buried, they have to be buried. And my father took a look. And these were the books, the svarim, of somebody who was really quite a scholar, quite a Talmud Chacham. And he said, who did these belong to? And the woman said to my father, but he passed away. And my father is, isn't there anybody in the family who could use them now? She said, well, I have a son but he's in public school, he can't read Hebrew. There's no way he can make use of these books. So since the child was young, six or seven years old, my father said, in memory of your father, let your son have a year of yeshiva education. Let him learn how to read Hebrew, let him learn a little bit something, get him started. And my father said, it will be tuition free, complete scholarship. Well, that boy went to the yeshiva, he loved learning. He was obviously carrying genes from this wonderful grandfather. And in the end, he became observant and became quite learned. And he asked my father to perform his wedding. At the wedding, my father said, I don't ordinarily give gifts to the bride and groom, but for this wedding, I have a gift that I have saved for this moment. And he gave the young groom, the svarim, the books that his grandfather had left behind and that had brought this young boy to his knowledge of Judaism and to becoming the person he was. I was so touched by that story, and I found it interesting that a non-Jewish Jewish professor of literature, Dr. Will Lee, who read this story in, in my book, told me to him that was the most moving thing. It said something about the value of tradition, the value of scholarship, and look what books could do. Now, you may be wondering, how is my father communicating so well? Because he was a person who did not know any English when he came to the country in 1933. My mother taught him, first of all, by speaking English with him. Second of all, by reading the New York Times with him. And third of all, he said, if I'm going to learn the language, I have to read the best of what was written in that language. So they read Shakespeare together, and they read Milton together, and um, my father learned how to speak English. In the beginning, when he wanted to give a talk in the synagogue in Shul, he was afraid that his English would not be good enough. So he would tell what he wanted to say to my mother. She would write it up in Yiddish, in English rather, but then she would transliterate it into Hebrew lettering because for him initially, that was easier than English lettering. He said, you have to realize English is so hard 
for somebody who doesn't drive is made up of so many different languages. He said, look at O-U-G-H. It could be rough, it could be through, it could be thorough. There's so many ways to pronounce those three letters, uh, four letters, O-U-G-H. And my mother saw him through by transliterating. And then finally he picked up English very well and spoke it fluently. Uh, he helped her because when she would write letters in Yiddish back to the family in Europe, she told my father, I'm trying to avoid any problem of diction, of, of uh, expression. So I'm writing much too simple letters. I hear parents are going to think that I'm very simplistic. So he, she and he would sit together to enhance her letters so that her parents should know that this daughter-in-law does speak Yiddish well and can write a very literal Yiddish. So they had gotten the school started. And at the same time, they started uh, adult education because my father felt that there were many people who did not know how to read Hebrew. And this is my addition. I often think that the reason the uh, conservative movement uh, permitted women to sit with men was that the men at least had learned how to read Hebrew before their bar mitzvah. But most of the women in the United States had not gotten any education. And um, uh, I, I think they wanted to sit next to their husbands just to know what was happening. My father made a class in learning how to read Hebrew every year in adult education. And he made a second class called The Geography of the Sitter, where he would teach people what was going on in the davening, why they were saying what they were saying, and what to do, when to stand, when to sit, when to bow, when to take three steps backward, when to take three steps forward, all the things that come so naturally to somebody who was raised in it, but have to be learned one by one by someone who's new to it. And he felt that the key to everything was learning. And that once you learned, you want to live a Torah life. My mother, meanwhile, was very busy with the, um, uh, the PTA and the sisterhood. Those were both very important organizations in the 1940s, 1950s, and even in the beginning of the 1960s. My mother befriended the women and worked with them and um, helped them. And they knew they could turn to her with any question, which just made it easier uh, for them to take on a lot more than they had originally envisioned. So that Elizabeth became a town that when my parents first started had less than 10 people who kept Shabbos to a very thriving, wonderful population of people who knew. My father was very concerned about girls' education. And this was something that my mother certainly understood because her father in 1920 had started a school when she was six years old. And it only lasted for three years because people were not yet ready for a day school. But he said that um, he heard people complaining in the community. Oh, of course the rabbi is starting a school. His daughter's a school age. He doesn't want to put her in public school at six. So he's starting yeshiva for her. He got up in the synagogue on Shabbos and he said, Rabbi I hear that people are saying I'm establishing this school because of my daughter. He said, you're right. You're right. She's also a Jewish daughter. In other words, she deserves to have an education as much as every Jewish child deserves to have an education. So you can't hold it against me that I'm starting it for my daughter. Yes, I'm starting it for my daughter and for every other Jewish child who wants to get the education. As I mentioned, it lasted three years and he started it again in 1930. But unfortunately, when he passed away in 1933, although my grandmother kept it going till the end of the year, my grandfather passed away in October. My grandmother kept it going through June, but then it was just too much. She couldn't uh, keep it going and um, it had to wait until my father uh, reopened the school, and on the third time, that was the time when it lasted. Um, he was asked why he wanted to build a separate building for the school. It had been me meeting on the second floor of the mikvah, and here again, he went directly to the question. It is asked. People want to know, why do you need a separate building? And he had to explain, if you want to have labs, if you want to have uh, an auditorium, if you want to have a playground, if you want to have a gym, you have to have all these things uh, in order to have a, a proper school. And he built 
he bought a building in 1947 in the best neighborhood of town. And in 1951, that building was raised and instead he built a beautiful school building. Uh, people noticed one thing about the school. He loved having Formica, Formica desks and the classrooms, Formica tables in the library, very practical reason. Formica can be kept clean very easily and it can't be damaged easily. And he wanted everything to be spiffy, everything to be shiny and clean. Uh, he wanted the whole association with being a Torah Jew not to be poverty and not to be messiness. He wanted it to be everything clean, well-kept, um, up to the minute. And that's why he wanted to move the Jewish neighborhood, which had been a religious neighborhood, had been down the port in an old, old neighborhood of a city that was already 400 years old. He wanted to move it up to the best neighborhood. He started with the school. He built a synagogue uh, next to the school. Uh, and everything he attended to style. After World War II, when he felt that he could make a dinner for the school, school had not been appropriate during the time of the war, but the first dinners for the Jewish Educational Center in Elizabeth, New Jersey, were held at the Waldorf Astoria, because he wanted to show to be orthodox is to be up to the minute and um, not to show anything that ind indicates poverty. Um, he advised Mishulachim, people who were going around collecting money for their yeshivos, um, that they should not go house to house in Elizabeth. He would have a fund in his office at the yeshiva, and if they would come to him, he would give them much more than they could collect by going house to house. And again, this is because he didn't want the association of being an observant Jew to be somebody going around um, collecting money, uh, usually somebody who looked quite poor. Um, he followed the um, Slavatka way, and my mother, having been raised in the Tells way, they both agreed. Every suit had to have smartly pressed pants. Shoes had to be freshly polished. Everything had to be uh, in the best condition possible. In fact, um, there's a teacher, um, uh, there was a teacher at the JEC who told a funny story, Rabbi Bomrin. On his first day, uh, he came into the building from one end. My father was coming in from the other end. And of course, the whole thing was shining. The whole summer had been spent getting the place into top shape. And he noticed a piece of paper on the floor. And my father noticed it at the same time. And as they were both approaching it, my father picked it up. And he expected my father to say something in Yiddish because he listened to my father's programs in Yiddish on the radio. And my father said to him, Rabbi Bamrin, I like an immaculate building. So Rabbi Bamrin told me he learned two things at that time. First of all, the rabbi speaks English very well. And second of all, he likes his building clean. <laughs> and he doesn't want any papers floating around on a freshly polished floor. My father was considered of everyone. When he um, built the shul, the new synagogue next to the, and the school building next to it, he um, made very good sight lines and very good hearing for the women's section as well as the men's section. Um, he saw no reason for women to have to strain in order to hear or to see what was going on. And when he built another synagogue in the Westminster section, in, a, in another very fine section of the city, in 1955, he built it with the same number of stairs, going down to the men's section and going up to the women's section. I don't remember if it was six or seven steps, but it's the same number of steps. The men walked down, the building was built uh, a, 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 I'm trying to think of the word, but it, 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 they had dug out the space for the men's section, put the men's section there, and on top of that, the women's section came next. What did this mean? That being in the women's section was not saying women get out of the way. It was saying we all have to concentrate on our davening, we all have to concentrate on our prayers, we all have to do things the way they were done in the Beit HaMikdash, the way they were done in the Temple of Jerusalem, and that means women and men have to be separated. But the men have to separate themselves from the women as much as the women have to separate themselves from the men. And that's why it was equal. The men go downstairs, the women go upstairs, but the women do not have to do 12 steps to get out of the way. The six steps the men take down and the six steps the women take up. And again, again with sight lines and hearing, wonderful. 
that you could follow everything. Nobody would miss anything being in the women's section. But this was my parents' attitude in everything they did. And they taught this to us. Always consider the other person. Always consider how is the other person experiencing this and do work accordingly. So for example, when there were a number of young families um, who wanted to start the Sabbath, wanted to start Shabbos early in the summer months because they wouldn't get home from the synagogue until 9, 9.15 at night. And they wanted to start, let's say 6.30, so they could get home in time for their children to hear Kiddush and to have the Sabbath meal together. My father said that was fine, as long as one prerequisite was kept. And that was it had to be a minion that met at the regular time. It didn't have to be at every shul in Elizabeth. At that point, there are now five synagogues in Elizabeth. But there had to be one synagogue, and that was the one where he would daven. Uh, if Shabbos was starting at 8 o'clock, they would start at 8 o'clock. If it was starting at 8.15, they would start at 8.15. And here was the reason he gave. If somebody got caught, which happened more than once at Newark Airport nearby, or on one of the highways, New Jersey Turnpike, or on the State Parkway, and they made their way to Elizabeth, this way they wouldn't be Michalel Shabbos. They wouldn't be desecrating the Sabbath, because until the last minion had started in town, it was not officially Shabbos in town. It was not officially the Sabbath in town. So that way, there would be less desecration of the Sabbath. If somebody made it to Elizabeth at 7.30 or at a quarter to 8 or 8 o'clock, he would still be before the Sabbath. The sun had not set yet, and it was not officially Shabbos in Elizabeth until the last million had died. His other consideration was that maybe there were people in town who were not yet observant. So if they would start Shabbos early, that would be two, two more hours of desecration of the Sabbath that these people would be having. So if they started the Sabbath late, then at least there were two hours that they were not yet desecrating the Sabbath, although he certainly hoped eventually they would become Shomer Shabbos, they would observe the Sabbath. But meanwhile, he was saving them from two hours of doing the wrong thing. And on the same basis, as soon as the Sabbath could be over, as soon as Shabbos could be over, my father would have Havdalah. Uh, would, would, they would do same Adava Marv, and they would have Havdalah in the shul. Uh, because he wanted to be clear that there should be as little desecration of the Sabbath as at all possible. The school went on to a boys high school, a girls high school, uh, buildings for each one, really beautiful buildings for each one, and um, always making sure that the Jewish studies, the Limudic Kodesh, should be top notch, and the secular studies should be top notch. Because my father felt nobody should feel that by going to yeshiva, they're somehow getting less prepared for the world. On the contrary, when he heard that a Bria graduate had gotten a MacArthur Fellowship and that a Masifta graduate, in fact, who's a rabbi uh, now in, um, in Canada, had gotten, uh, in, in Toronto, I think, in, had gotten a Rhodes Scholarship, whatever, uh, that the students got National Merit Scholarships, um, he was really very happy to know that they were succeeding in every way um, as a result of having gotten a yeshiva education. And um, when the Ivy League schools started realizing that yeshiva high school graduates are wonderful people to have on campus, their parents are used to paying tuition, which is a big thing. Uh, they're used to a long day at school, so they're not overwhelmed by what's required at college. And they tend to finish within four years of starting. When the dropout rate in the United States is that after six years from entering in September, by June, six years later, later only 50% of the students have graduated. There's a big dropout rate. And with the high school graduates, the yeshiva high school graduates, they graduated within four years, they paid the tuition, they did the work, and they succeeded admirably. So when he heard that at Princeton in 1961, there was a group of young men who wanted to keep kosher, and they wanted to rent a place where they could have a cook cook for them. Princeton, you know, has dining clubs. So they were going to make a kosher place of their own. They're, the landlord would not rent to them. He was afraid the students might not pay the rent ultimately, and he'd be out of, uh, out of money. My father got involved. He did not have a student from JEC at Princeton at that time. Later on, there were students from the JEC who went to Princeton. He signed the lease. 
and he found a person in the community. I won't go into the details, but he knew this person would be happy to help any college student keep kosher. This man donated all the furniture, everything in the kitchen, everything that was needed to make the house a place to eat and live um, easily, this man donated. My father gave the Sefer Torah, gave the Sidurim, gave the Chumashim, gave everything that was necessary for them to start davening at the house. And my brother and my husband both went down during the first years to give shurim, to give Torah classes. And um, years later, when Princeton realized how wonderful it was to have these Yeshiva High School graduates, and um, the dining club was allowed to move onto campus, and they made a big dedication of the kosher facility on campus. I don't know if it was to my brother or to my father, but the president of Princeton came over and said, Rabbi, did you ever dream that you would see this? The answer was yes, that's exactly why we invested in making kosher dining at Princeton. And after that, across the board, Ivy League schools and other schools started making kosher kitchens because they realized from Princeton's experience, you get some very good students that way. And it's a big plus to have kosher provision at a, at a university. My father started something else that was unique and that was teaching Torah on the radio. He felt that a number of socialists, for whom Yiddish was their original language, um, just let me see the time. Okay, thank you. For whom Yiddish was their original language would now want to come back to some of the learning from their youth. Socialism had not turned out to be the religion that they believed in. And there's a station called WEVD, named for Eugene, Eugene Z. Debs, um, the socialist leader, called the station that spoke your language. My father started teaching Talmud on the radio Saturday night from 9 to 9.30, and in the spring months from 9.30 to 10, he called it Daf HaShavua, a page a week. It wasn't actually a page a week, but it was a good amount of Gemara that was covered each week. And a lot of things happened. First of all, it took off tremendously, even though he was criticized by some people. If you do anything new, you will be criticized. So he knew that, but fine. He had uh, approbation from Rav Herzog, the chief rabbi of Israel, uh, from um, Lubavitch Rebbe, from the Sri Deesh, Rabbi Hill Yaakov Weinberg, um, from Dr. Belkin, uh, the president of Yeshiva University. And these were the people whose opinion mattered. And meanwhile, it expanded to 200,000 people listening to Dafa Shavua. People asked for tapes, and he sent out to start radio programs in a number of cities across America and in Montreal and in Toronto at that time. And um, he started with tapes that were done like this. Uh, I don't know if you can see it, but this is the way that um, you recorded it initially on, uh, on, the sil on a silver looking wire. Then he graduated to the eight inch uh, tapes. And then finally, when people were asking for tapes to be sent, um, this is a Dafa Shavua a uh, bunch of cassettes and cassettes like this, so that people could follow it. And Kol uh, Yisrael La Gola, the radio station that was broadcasting to uh, Russia, uh, put Dafa Shavua on. And there were some people who were amazed when they turned on their clandestine radio station and found Gemara being taught in Russia in the 1950s and the 1960s. It was incredible to them. In fact, one man told my father afterward when he got out of Russia that when he first heard it, he thought Mashiach must have arrived because what is this? Talmud being taught in Yiddish on the radio in Russia it was just incredible to him. And my father's attitude was to think all along, all over. For example, when women used to write in with questions um, about somebody who told the Gemara, he would answer the question and he would say on the radio, I am so glad that women are learning Gemara at the same time. And when I asked him, you know, people criticize, I learned Gemara in fifth and sixth grade at Yeshiva Elizabeth together with the boys. And then when I came to uh, high school in Brooklyn, girls were amazed. What girls learning? Tom had never heard that. So when I asked my father about that, he said, don't try to answer anyone. Gemara is the way to become a knowledgeable Jew. If this will be the era where girls will start learning Gemara, this will go down as a golden era in Jewish life. And he felt, encourage knowledge wherever you can and uh, don't turn it off from anybody. 
And in fact, the logo, the Yeshiva Elizabeth, I think you can see it. It shows you what looked like Luchos at the back, a Jewish star, and a globe, a globe of the world, and a safer, a book open underneath. And that was what he intended. He wanted Torah to go everywhere to everyone who wanted it. It shouldn't be a closed book for anyone. My parents went to Russia 22, well, they went together 21 times because my father wanted, my, my father and my mother both wanted him to go on her passport. Since at that time, you could get a single passport for a couple. And he didn't want to have to put that down too much about his background since he was anti-communist. And um, he just wanted to have my mother's information uh, on, on the, as the main information on the passport. And it was a protection that he was with an American citizen. The one year that my mother couldn't go, when she stayed to help me after I gave birth to, in 1967 to my son Yitzhi, thank God, um, my sister Shalamis went with him. And another trip, my sister Ellen went. And they saw how much my mother did to make it possible for my father to accomplish what he did. I'll just tell you two things quickly because there was so much more that went on. But uh, uh, three things, okay, but <laughs> so much more that went on. Um, my father used to carry gittin, bills of divorce, back and forth between the United States and Russia or between Israel and Russia. Because sometimes one member of a couple wanted to leave and the other couple member wanted to stay. But if they wouldn't be divorced from each other, they really couldn't go on with their lives. And my father also set up a group to write down all the details in Russia so he could carry it back to the United States for a scribe, a sofer, to write up the get, which he could then deliver to the person who had to receive the get. That was one thing, that he made a number of people able to go on with their lives because he was doing this. Another thing he did was to bring as much as he could into Russia, including prayer books, including Sidurim. And a uh, fellow who was a professor at Connecticut College, uh, Stuart Miller, a graduate of JEC, uh, wrote to me that when he was in Russia at one point, he'd been sent there on a mission. Um, a refusenik told him, do you know Rabbi Tite? And he was uh, prepared for him to say, why is he against demonstrations in, in, in the United States? And he said, yes. And this refusing it said, and he kind of kissed his lips and opened his, uh, his uh, hands, his fingertips that way. He said, do you know, he is responsible for all of us knowing Hebrew. He said, he used to bring those to Durham. At the opening of the sitter, he had the Hebrew alphabet, the Russian alphabet, telling you how to pronounce the letter. He had instructions for how to do everything in that sitter. He had a whole uh, section of pages showing pictures of different fruits and vegetables and foods with the word in Hebrew and transliteration in Russian and the word in Russian. So he said those Sudurim were very important for all of us to learn how to be a Jew. And um, my father said he knew that sometimes the people who were really government agents in the shuls were selling the Sudurim when they were supposed to be giving them out free of charge. But as um, uh, Sam Halpern put it when that argument was raised to him. Uh, he was one of the people funding this. He said, so that man can make Shabbos now and somebody else has a sitter as a result. As long as the sitter and as long as the prayer books are getting distributed, that's all that matters. The third thing that I found out, and again, I'm not going to tell anything more because my father was, my parents were both very careful not to tell us with whom they met, what they did or anything of the kind. But when I went to be Menachem Ovo to console a mourner when the matriarch of the family that had come from Russia passed away, they said to me, do you know what your father actually did? I said, no, he was very careful not to talk because he was afraid that somebody in Russia might get into trouble. They said that they had sold everything they could and put everything into rubles that they could, but there was nothing that they could do with it because when you left Russia, you had to leave all your money behind. And they wanted to take it out, but they were afraid that when they would get out, they would be impoverished. My father told them to give him the rubles and he would distribute that in Russia, which he did, giving money to refuseniks, giving money to elderly Jews who could no longer work. There were some Tamidei Chachamim left, helping them out, doing everything he could. And of course, when he came back to customs to go onto the plane to go back to the States, there was no record of his having had these rubles or having given them out in Russia. When this family came to the United States, my father gave them in dollars the equivalent of all that they had given him in rubles. And they said, that's how we were able to get started. 
And they said, we don't know if he did this for other families because he was very careful to be as quiet about what he was doing as possible. And when I asked him, how come you were so against demonstrations? He said, no, let the kids demonstrate. High school kids, college kids, let them all demonstrate. Even let leaders in the Jewish community demonstrate. But there has to be a way to function within Russia, which I would not be able to do if I participated in the demonstration. And there has to be somebody to be diplomatic. I won't go into all the diplomatic things he did, but he did many things to save cemeteries and to save the Jews of Russia. There's so much more to tell what he did to maintain kosher shechita, uh, to maintain kosher slaughterhouses, um, what he um, did for kashas in general. I, I can't go into all these things, but um, just one second. He believed in always taking a new look at a problem. And when the uh, Port Authority in New York switched from gathering tolls in New Jersey and New York and decided just to take tolls in New Jersey, because after all, how else were you going to leave New York except by a bridge or a tunnel? So they just doubled the price in New Jersey. He said that was so evident that you just needed somebody to think in a new way. And that was what he thought we had to do in Jewish life. We had to think in new ways, like making Torah in motion so that people all over can learn at the same time. Um, and he said, when you have to make a decision, don't rush. Uh, say, I'll think about it overnight and I'll tell you tomorrow. But of course you have to tell the person tomorrow because that was the way that you made considered non-impulsive decisions. My parents shared a concern for children. They wanted to see every child happy. When a young kid, only 10 years old, lost her mother and looked very bereft, my father came home and said, I can't stand it. As a kid, so fine, as a yell, that a child should be so alone and so unhappy. My mother said, well, she's right between the ages with Rivka and Shalamis. Let her come and live with us for a year until her father can get himself together again. And that's exactly what they did. And she came and lived with us. My parents had many people stay with us for quite long amounts of time. Uh, my mother used to call lonely people every morning and used to visit them on Shabbos afternoon. She said, it's telling a person you count, you matter. And I wanna start the day by talking to you. And I wanna enjoy Shabbos by being with you. Even though one of the women that she went to was so crippled that she could not get out of her apartment at all, my mother would take us along to keep it more interesting. The funny thing is that when we wrote about our parents, we had an interesting dilemma. I wrote about my father and I wrote about him in English. Um, Rabbi Kelman showed you the book in English, Learn Torah, Love Torah, Live Torah. And my father's cousin, whom he got out of Russia, Rabbi Yitzhak Zilber, he had his father's autobiography in Russian. So he gave me a copy in Russian. The one word I could make out was Evreya, and it's um, to remain a Jew, but I can't read Russian. And my cousin couldn't read uh, English. So we each had the other one's book, and we each had a picture of the other one's father with our father in the book. So for example, here he had a picture of my father uh, with his father, and I won't go into it, but I had the same thing in my book. A few years later, my book was published in Hebrew, the Samachta B'chayecha, Rejoice in Your Life, which was my father's approach. We have the Samachta B'chayecha, Rejoice in Your Holidays. He said, Rejoice in Your Life, the Samachta B'chayecha. I was able to give that to my cousin, and he had his book translated into English to remain a Jew, and he was able to give that to me. And again, we each had a picture of our fathers together. They first met in Tashkent um, very late in the game. Uh, he had moved there because he thought it would be easier to lead an observant life far away from the center of Russia. When my father heard that there was somebody that he might be in Tashkent, he and my mother flew to Tashkent, which is in Asia. And um, my father went to shul, and he heard somebody being called up as Yitzchak Yosef Ben Ben Sio. He thought, that's my cousin. They had never met each other. Their mothers were sisters. Afterward, they went to a park together, the two couples. He and his wife sat facing one way. My mother and my father sat facing the other way. And they talked as though husband and wife were talking, but they were actually talking together. And my father ultimately got him and his family out. Rabbi Cummins, can I say one more thing? Okay, one more thing. A lot of what you hear and see is not what actually happened. 
uh, I've had this discussion with um, Professor Schneer Leiden that stories take on a life of their own. So for example, there was a story in Hamodia uh, in October, the very paper that my father's uncle founded, Shelo Haya Below Nivra. It never happened. My father is in that story, and we all checked around among the family. It didn't happen, but somehow that story got attached to, attached to my father's name. Or a book was written about getting the grave in Uman, the grave of the Breslover saved. Here is the book. Here are all these uh, papers show you where the facts are incorrect. And what hurts the most is that the author of this book asked me for a lot, a lot of um, documents about work in Russia, about different things that had been done and how the grave in Uman was saved. I gave this all to him thinking he was writing a factual book. When I got the book, he attributed my father's doing what he did to somebody else urging him. I won't go into any other facts about it. But it didn't happen that way. And that's a book that's selling all over Israel now. But the thing that bothered me most was um, the whole story of um, uh, Rav Baruch Ber visiting my grandfather's house and my mother and my aunt both remembering that they sang Zemiros, although Rav Baruch Ber and his son, Lord Ruben Kozlovsky were at the table and that my grandfather permitted the girls to sing. I will just tell you the accurate story. Rev. Ruben looked up a little bit. He was wondering, teenage girls are singing at the table, they're singing Zemiros. And Rev. Baruch Ber noticed and said, they're singing, they're not singing. And there are two versions which tell you that I am not asserting that my version is the only correct one. Either Rev. Baruch Ber said, they're praising Hashem above with Psalms, or they love in der Evershter mit inigunim, or they're uh, praising the Lord above, Hashem above, uh, with melodies. But he did not think that they were not allowed to sing Zmiros at the table. Later on, a story came out, and Rabbi Shraki, um, uh, <laughs> one second, um, from Baltimore, uh, uh, told me um, that his Rav Ruderman told him, what, what's it, Rav Newberger. Sh Newberger, thank you. I'm thinking, well, <laughs> thanks to my husband. Rav Shrager Newberger told him that Rav, Newberger, Rav uh, Ruderman told him he admired that Rabbi Prail had his daughter sing because he said that kept them close to their Jewish roots. That kept them in touch and feeling that they're part of what everything that Yiddishkeit is about. And he said, and look what they went on to do. He said the older daughter, Basia, and her husband built a beautiful community in Elizabeth and the day school there. And Chana Kittel, Hannah, Rebetzin Raymond, she and her husband, Rebecca Pesach Raymond, built RPRY, which was named for him after he passed away, and built a community uh, in first in New Brunswick, then in Highland Park, Edison, New Jersey. So Rabbi Priel was right. I think that's something to keep in mind. I'll just show as a final picture uh, a very happy picture of my parents. And um, that was their, very much their attitude was to enjoy every moment that you can. And I'm just going to show this very quickly because it's true of all parts of the family. I'm just showing one part. My son is now the Rav, and this is a family picture in the shul in Beachwood, Ohio, my son Benjamin. My son Yaakov teaches Torah. And this is a book that my father would love to cover up because he's talking about medieval commentary in the modern era. But it shows a scroll, a written scroll, a handwritten scroll unfolding from a laptop. And that's exactly what my father would have valued, bring into the modern era everything from the past. And my son Yitzhak wrote this book, Fresh Fruit and Vintage Wine. And it's about the ethics and wisdom of the Agatha. So I could give examples from all parts of the family, but thank God we're trying to carry on what they, what was most important. And um, uh, I would just end with two sayings that my father had. One was be modern, be orthodox, which he said at a time when people thought that orthodoxy was finished. And the Torah speaks the language of tomorrow. And he could show you so many verses that anticipated situations that would come later on where the Torah already had the answer. Okay, now I'll take comments. Thank you very much. It's a really um, 
the love, I think, you know, for your family and the pride, your family is really beautiful to see and, and the nuckies you have from your children, who I know some of them and uh, really uh, doing wonderful work and really uh, thank you very much for that talk. If um, anybody wants to, of course, type in something in the chat box, please, please do so. Just remind them, of course, we'll continue tomorrow with our series on Tanakh Eov, one of the more difficult books. Moshe Sokolov, Dr. Moshe Sokolov from, from Yeshiva University will be teaching Eov. And tomorrow night, Rabbi, Rabbi Barry Gelman from Houston, Texas will be giving our Parsha year. Parsha is going to be starting a half an hour late. He has a conflict. He's in, in Houston, Central Time. He'll be, he'll be starting at 9 o'clock as opposed to 8.30, our regular time. So that's for tomorrow. But if anybody has any questions, um, yeah, okay. Well, um, I, I answered one. It was called Mariah at first, the school in uh, New Brunswick. And then after Rav Raymond passed away, it was renamed RPR Library by Pesach Raymond Yeshiva. You're right. Ah, uh, somebody wrote that he heard this story about singing on Rabbi Asher Franz tape. Yes, but <laughs> the accurate story is what Rabbi Shrachi Neuberger said that um, uh, Rav Rudman thought that uh, my grandfather had done the right thing, allowing the girls to sing. Ah, here, <laughs> yes, thank you. Benjamin Sampson wrote, remembering the start of the program, Lomer Lernen of Lat Gemara, Daf Hashavua. Yes, that's exactly, and wherever I go, when people hear my name, uh, that, that's what they, uh, that, that's what they uh, say to me. Uh, Simi raised her hand, what, what should I do about that? Okay, I can unmute people if somebody wants to actually speak, speak, which I just did. Just uh, if you're not talking, or asking a question, do mute yourself. But uh, anybody's anything they want to ask. I mean, I would assume, if I may ask, I would assume uh, he wouldn't be thrilled how some of the directions of much of orthodoxy has taken in current times, if I could ask that. Sort of the negation of modernity, um, not being cool and modern and clean, and all those things that he derived has not taken hold across the Orthodox world. Well, so, so my brother, my brother is saying, "What? What are you saying, Rabbi Lesmeyer Tice?" It's okay. I'm listening. Oh, you're listening. Okay. Um, I'll tell something which I'll tell very carefully because my father was not saying a blanket condemnation, but. Um, he once asked me, uh, why does the Baal Takeya, the one who's blowing the shofar, why does he hold the shofar to the right, over his right shoulder? And I didn't know. I thought maybe Lev Chacham Yimin, the heart of a wise person, goes to the right. My father said, no, what you have to watch out for very carefully is the Satan who misleads you from the right. That, that's the one who tells you, you are so good. You are so fine, so perfect. If everybody would be like you, what would the world would be? And my father said, that's the danger, taking yourself as the standard that everyone has to live according to. And he said, so watch out for the satan from the right telling you, oh, you are so right and everybody else is so wrong. Consider why the other person is thinking and feeling the way he is and don't just write them off and say, my standard or nothing. I hope that was said clearly enough. I'm not trying to criticize. Oh, no, no, I, 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 I'm, I'm just sort of asking, you know, it's, uh, we don't see enough of that in the world, if I can yeah. say so, yeah. you know, that it's, uh, I, I think the Orthodox world is very self-confident today. They don't care what other people think anymore. It's not like they don't have to do themselves. They have succeeded to the point where they're not concerned about others. Right. Perhaps. And that, wor that worried my father very much. Yeah. That worried yeah. him very much. You know, it was, it was, it's, it's the same with all the schools. Don't accept people. You know, their standards for accepting people is very different than it once was because they needed the students back then. And today they don't need the schools. They're, you know, all the schools are full. But. And I have to tell you that some of the best families who moved to Elizabeth came because two brothers had their store open on Shabbos where they were living at that time. They moved away after that. But they were not allowed to have their children enter the yeshiva nearby because they only took families from Shomer Shop. They only took children from Shomer Shop families. And my father took the exact opposite attitude. When they came to him about the thought of moving to Elizabeth and said, we're about to be Shomer Shabbos, but we're not keeping Shabbos yet. We hope we will be able to. My father's attitude was, but those are exactly the children who need the school. And those are exactly the families who need the school. 
Right. And of course, in the end, yeah. the brothers succeeded. Well, they, they, they kept. Want to mute yourself, people? Shh. Okay, no, just. Uh, they they, they uh, kept Shabbos, and, and, and their families became very fine Jewish families. Somebody wants to know if your father was involved with, you know, you know Yavne, college organization. I know that was popular. Very much so. Case, I believe. Very much so. In fact, he came up to Boston, for, to Brooklyn for Shabbos to speak for Yavne uh, conference there. And he had the leaders of Yavne uh, gather at our house on a Saturday night. And um, he spoke to them about the fact that don't think of yourselves as just oh, we're making the future of campus. stopping Shabbos exams on campus. He said you're a movement, you're the future, and think of yourselves as a movement. And in fact, the first address for Yavne, when nobody wanted to use their own parents' address as the place, and the OU had not yet given us um, an office, which came two years later, the first address was 531 Fulton Street, Elizabeth, New Jersey, my parents' home. Because my father said, so use that to the Yavne mailings, and that's what we did. He was very, very caring that Yavne should succeed. Yeah. So, okay, I'm, I'm going to mute everybody again. And Rivka, I'm going to, Dr. Blau, you can unmute yourself, I think, just because it was getting too noisy. That's why we keep people muted, but sometimes at the end, okay, I thought. Um, hold on a second. Okay. Yeah. Um, somebody is asking your father's attitude about Princeton. How, uh, Many of the people, you know, were against. Uh, Your dad's attitude with helping students in Princeton as opposed to with Tells where she who didn't want to help Orthodox students to be in a separate sexes in dormitory. I, I, I don't know about that whole question, but I, I, I do know that um, uh, as, as far as I know, you, you always have the choice when you're at a university of um, either being with the roommate that you wanted to be with or taking an apartment near campus. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what, what that question is. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not I mean, going to try to answer. There, there was a case, I don't know, 25 years ago at Yale, I believe, who went to the, the Supreme oh. Court. Well, Yale, Yale University forced um, the first year students to live on campus in a co-ed dorm. And five Orthodox students said they'll pay for it, but they want to live off campus. And they went to the Supreme Court. And from what I understand, I think Yale won. And the kids were forced to live on campus. I think two of them married each other eventually. I don't remember. Uh -huh. But I imagine back in the 60s, you didn't have that issue in Princeton. No, no, that was not an issue. Uh, in the yes. 60s, it was, it was different. You could live in a, in a same-sex dormitory, not like yeah. nowadays. It's a whole different world. Yeah. You know? but, um, yeah. And now with COVID, they're very happy if you take an apartment off campus and uh, are not busy spreading anything uh, in the dormitory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So are. Yes. Uh, okay. Any other questions? Otherwise, Dr. Blau, really, thank, thank you very much. 